This is about the grant of citizenship. This is the most valuable thing. The Global Passport Investor is your go-to podcast. Welcome to the latest episode of the Global Passport Investor. I'm your host, Eric Major. I'm an investment migration expert with three decades in the game. This is the latest in a series of talks that we have on citizenship, on residency, and all things investment migration. If you're watching this on YouTube, please leave your questions in the comments section. And for those of you who are listening at the podcast, We'd I invite you to email your queries, questions at globalpassportinvestor.com. So today we're going to be talking about Antigua and Barbuda citizenship by investment. And before we meet our very special guests, let's go over a bit of geography. So where is exactly uh, the islands of Antigua and Barbuda? The CIA have put together a fascinating book called The World Factbook. And in this fact book, they talk about uh, each country and they have a section on Antigua and they simply say the following, Caribbean, islands between the Caribbean Sea and the North Atlantic Ocean, and it's east and southeast of Puerto Rico. So that's our geography lesson over. <laughs> Let's talk now about what is citizenship by investment. Well, essentially, it's a quick, quid pro quo. I can't pronounce that. It's a quick pro quo transaction. Uh, in exchange for Antigua and Barbudan citizenship, one, uh, normally a wealthy individual or family, they make an investment in the country pursuant to a, a list of prescribed regulations and guidances. Okay, enough about the course. Now we meet our very special guest today. We have Sherilyn Hugh Thomas. Did I pronounce that properly? Hughes. Hughes. Yes. Uh, and uh, of course, my uh, dear friend and longest Antiguan uh, friend of mine, because it's been already 10 years, we got Gay Hashmi, who is also joining. Thank you for coming on short notice, no less. Both of you, you flew in yesterday, no, this yesterday night? Let's so, call it yesterday. yesterday <laughs> just adjusting to the time zones. Yes, we are. And I know you have a busy week ahead of you. So uh, for our listeners, uh, I'm going to, uh, well, first of all, Sherilyn, it's worth mentioning what you do. What's your day job? Sure. I am the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the Antigua and Barbuda Citizenship by Investment Program. Excellent. I am primarily responsible for the investment portfolio as well. So that takes care of the real estate and business options, those two options and um, oversight of marketing and IT. Yes, indeed, yes. which is what brings you here to explain uh, this interesting business. And Gay, you've been, as I said in the intro, um, in this field now for a decade, as I know, but you have many hats. Which one do you want to show today? Uh, well, I can give you a bit of a, <laughs> show you a few. Um, I'm actually a licensed agent for Antigua and Barbuda. Um, citizenship by investment program. I'm also an authorized representative mm -hmm. for the program as well as uh, into real estate. We yes. have a real estate company as well, as well as we're developers with the Moongate um, Hotel and Spa. Um, I was also a former member of the Antigua and Barbuda Task Force that set up the Citizenship by Investment program. So we were there from the beginning. Mm -hmm. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary. And we're very proud of, of the program and where it's come. It's come a long way. It sure has. And it's working really well. Indeed it is. And, and I just, uh, for our listeners, want to define a, a few of those hats. Uh, you, you mentioned local license agents. So those are, as you know, Sherilyn, you have a number of local uh, residents and nationals who have the right to represent a, a client and submit their application to the, your unit. That's so that's one body of people which yeah. you're licensed. Um, and then you have these uh, author, uh, authorized these representatives, which we also tend to call marketing, marketing agents, agents, which yes. firms like Latitude, but you also have an international uh, or an authorized uh, representative license gate. Is that what you were saying? That's correct. So you have a legal right to not just submit, but to promote. Um, and Moongate's a great development, which you were just explaining to our team in terms of the offering that fits under the citizenship real estate yes. option. That's right. Uh, and yes, you and I had the privilege, that's where we first met in 2013, 10 years ago, when the government was just looking at this, studying this, and we're already into that, when did it all happen? So it was 
about 11 years ago, I think, the, the government was starting to think about, do we want to do actually, this? Actually, it was 12 years ago. Yeah, 12? Yeah, we yeah. started we around 12 We actually spent around two and a half, yeah. two and yeah, and a half two, years yeah. actually going through the program. Yes, and, and, ref and we, reflecting on, on what others were doing and, and whether this is something... And you had quite a contingent. You had uh, five or six of you that were part of that task force, even maybe more at some point. I mean, you had yeah. there were border seven? patrol. Yeah, yeah. We had, yes, we did have border control. We had representation from the Bar Association, yes. from the real estate community, and Miss Miss Hashmi was one of the leading representa um, representatives from that community, um, law enforcement. Yeah, we it, it was quite quite a group. Yeah, it was good that the government was very um, broad and, and inclusive in trying to get. Uh, all the potential stakeholders to review and, and consider this because you know citizenship it's a big deal it it's is. a big deal it's always politically charged that's in every very, jurisdiction. Uh, very emotional it's very emotional for right them. it shouldn't be taken like this so it's a big decision for any country um, to bestow that privilege but I know you guys take it very seriously and I'm going to start with maybe that line of questioning for you, uh, Sherilyn, because I know this is what you spend most of your time, if not all your time, really looking at these applications. Um, first, can you give us a flavor of, of who do you see are applying? Where, where, where are these applicants coming from? And of course, the answer is the world. <laughs> but um, And it may have evolved over the years, but just it's give a flavor of, of what you're seeing maybe as of late. It sure has evolved. Um, there was a time when as many as 70% of our applications came from China. Um, oh, that really? There was a concentration there. We still have um, good representation in terms of the number of applications that, that come from China, but we've been able to diversify interest in the program significantly. Mm -hmm. And so while the world um, does sound as if it's uh, a pat answer, we do have applicants who have come from more than 130 countries into no kidding. yes into our program and we have areas of concentration we we get good interest from the middle east we have an, an increasing um, interest from the african continent particularly nigeria um, we've also seen a huge uptick from the us um, which is a new demographic for us in terms of the numbers. Mm. Um, so U.S. citizens and, and some from the U.K. and Canada as well. And then we have a smattering okay. across the globe. So we, there has been an evolution in the source markets that well, we have been servicing. I, I myself have been surprised by that. Uh, as I said in the intro, 30 years in the business, I would have never thought that you know one of our top source uh, countries uh, for these types of programs would be the United States of America, and it has become very significantly so. Gay, I know you, uh, as a local license agent, uh, see that and submit that, but you're also seeing with this um, North American market uh, maybe a few looking at even making a connection to the. You want to comment on what's maybe evolved with respect to the clientele and how maybe this North American market is, is unique in, in some respect? I think um, they're, they're unique primarily because of the proximity. I mm -hmm. think Antigua has to uh, the U.S. Um, we have daily flights coming in you know, from Miami twice a day to New York to basically most of the hubs into Atlanta, into um, is it, um, North Carolina, Carolina as well. Yeah. So we, uh, we have definitely have a lot of um, airlift into to the U.S. So I think primarily the Americans are are used to come into the Caribbean for vacation and over the years. And I think more and more they're looking, because of the political situation in mm -hmm. America, persons are looking for somewhere that's close by to home, that they can be back home within three and a half, four hours. They can be back at home. Se and they have several options per day yeah. in, in getting there. And um, they feel quite comfortable um, within it's the environment. It's familiar. It's familiar. Yeah, it's familiar. And because of the fact also, I think that we have quite a lot of um, Americans that have second homes mm -hmm. in, in Antigua mm -hmm. and in the Caribbean in general. So for them, it's not such a difficult transition. Yeah, or extension you know? of, yeah. you know, they'd love a home in a parad paradise setting like Antigua offers. And at the same time, if it comes with the benefits of second citizenship, 
given the, the, the challenges of the turmoil that may for some be appearing, uh, it's an easier Easy. extension, I guess, for, yeah, for that market. Yeah, it's just a second option, and I think that, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter what side of the divide you fall on. So mm -hmm. we're seeing both, um, both sides of the... <laughs> Yes, um, the it's true. Actually, politics. We're yeah. not seeing just one over the other. It, it is. It's not a party thing. No. It's not a party. Thing. And what makes um, the the bucket tip for each applicant is different. Uh, there's yeah. been so many different little issues that are big issues for some and and less for others. But uh, there's been enough issues that the bucket's <laughs> tipping. Depending. Oh, it's very so interesting, actually. It, it is, and 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 not just there but the world in general is a more uh, it would seem more precarious place uh, it, with each passing day so there's a lot of dynamics at play that bring these kind of solutions to bear so it's not just a China thing anymore it's not just a Middle East thing it's not just an Africa thing. it's Americans and Canadians and UK nationals you know we've done European together, nationals European we've nationals done Germans French yeah. yeah you know we're it's, doing Italians, and then you throw into that the lifestyle, which, by the way, that isn't COVID taught us that that you can run a business with a laptop. You, you, you <laughs> certainly <laughs> can. You right? certainly can. Yeah. So before we move on to the next question, let me remind you, uh, our YouTube viewers, that you can leave your questions in the comment section, and if you're listening uh, to the podcast, please email us at questions at globalpassportinvestor.com. The greatest investment you could ever make is an investment in your future. Rift Trust and Latitude Group is the leading provider of residency and citizenship solutions for high net worth individuals. Our clients are like our extended family. We're a global firm with a local focus. What makes us truly unique is our leadership team. 100 years of combined industry experience and we're working every day with governments to improve and build new residency and citizenship programs. Obtaining a second residence or citizenship is the best modern insurance policy for you and your family. Our clients expect the world. We, we deliver. deliver it. Hello, Hello to freedom. freedom. Now, I occasionally get this question, so I'm going to ask it uh, to you, Sherilyn, is that, you know, there's, as we know, a donation option, and there's real estate, and there's even business options. But under this this donation to the National Development Fund. Uh, some of our listeners may want to just get an idea. What is that money used for? Are there examples of, of things that you've seen um, the government actually uh, benefit from this and the, and the citizens out of it as well? Like, What can you comment over the years? Sure, absolutely. The, there's a lot that is supported by the NDF option of the Citizenship by Investment Program. And so the government's recurrent expenditures, while they have recurrent revenue that tends to meet and support that, there is always something additional to be done. There's always um, some unexpected maintenance, new project that has to happen. Oh, absolutely. So the NDF has been used for almost anything that a government demand would be on. It's used for budgetary support. Mm -hmm. um, if a particular, there, I don't think there's a there's an, a ministry that has not benefited from the government saying from this source of revenue, which is non-tax, um, we can support something that you need to have done a new project, a um, repairs, maintenance, um, and supporting something like that. But for really um, significant work that's been done, we've acquired high-level equipment cutting edge equipment for our main hospital okay. um, to, to do a number of things that ordinarily the government would not have been able to supply. We've retrofitted schools and we've done a lot of... Um, I think your airport, I saw some um, uh, some solar panels as well last time. Oh, there. That was maybe a few years ago. It already, was. It but was. I hadn't been in a while. I said, oh, this is the solar panels. I remember That's correct. they were pro promoting at the time. That's mm -hmm. correct. So, yeah. um, so yes, in, in technology and green, t green energy, um, we've financed a number of those initiatives under the program. We have done debt reduction. Um, yeah, that's a key one. And islands like ours are heavily saddled with debt. Mm -hmm. And so we've been able to take... Mm -hmm. Um, earnings from the National Development Fund to reduce that debt burden. Yes. Um, so, 
as an economist, that resonates. I, yes. I know the stats. I read them, <laughs> not just for Antigua, but your neighboring islands, and yes. that's transformative. When you go to a world of debt to, DD, to GDP, GDP ratio of uh, 200 or 167 percent, and you bring that down to 80, 90 mm-hmm. or less, if you can. But you know, we there was COVID as well recently, so there, there's been all these other uh, incidences. But anything that gets you below that 100 percent mark is is a healthier place mm-hmm. particularly when we consider the u.s is probably hovering at 150 160 and japan's at 200 and somewhat percent so uh it, but for an island nation it's very important that is could be crippling and often is um gay i know you, you come to these conferences you travel the world here you are in dubai uh, you know there are other neighboring islands but we know your favorite um <laughs> how do you th- how do you think Antigua and Barbuda citizenship by investment distinguishes itself vis-a-vis uh, the others? Really? I, that's a good question. And that's a question that's asked all the time. Clients ask me that all the time. Um, I think Antigua's lifestyle in particular, um, in comparison to the other islands, um, we tend to be a little bit more sophisticated mm-hmm. than the other islands. I mean, from the time you arrive at the airport, our airport, we have the best airport in the Caribbean, <laughs> in Eastern Caribbean. Sure do. Um, so. You know, the, the whole infrastructure in general, we, have, um, we tend to have a first world infrastructure in a third world country, if you could say that. Yes. And um, I think that um, somewhere that, you know, I would think that it's easier for persons adapting to it. It comes back up again to proximity again to the US, etc that we have, um, that I think that people look at, and I think it differentiates, we have more airlift in and well, out than most of the say, other islands. I remember 10 years ago, when we looked at this as a firm, we, we, we re- recognized that there seemed to be more airlift. Would that still be the case, I think? It's yeah. still a very connected island compared to your peers, I think. Yeah. And that yeah. counts, that helps in, in making those bridges. Definitely, I mean, the, the yachting industry that we have, I mean, we have a tremendous um, yachting industry. Um, that and we have big um, second homes for a lot of the yes, some of the most the uh, well-known persons. I mean, from Giorgio Armani to Eric Clapton, we have a you know yeah. we have quite a few celebrities that live on the island um, and like to call Antigua their their home as well, their second homes. And I can go on, on and on with the yeah. names, but yeah. um, I think it's just um, it's a very relaxing place. It's a very friendly place. Mm. Our crime rates are uh, you know, very good. It's actually one of the lowest in the, in the in whole the region. region. Yes. Um, so we have, we have a lot going for us. For and, yeah. Yeah. And we, it, the and quality of life yeah. that we have. It's, it's I could vouch for that, and I've been to all the islands, but Antigua scores very high. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you want to add to it, Because sure, yes. you seem passionate about that question. I, 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 <laughs> I am. You're all passionate about it. <laughs> I am. And the, pa- the passion queen is right next to me <laughs> with this program. Ms. Heshmi will get hands on us if we, if we don't do it right. So we try to do it right. But programmatically, um, we, we have the most options in terms of what's on offer. Yes. And since inception, it's always been the intent to attract as diverse um uh, a group of, of, of potential investors. People have different interests and respond to different things. Mm-hmm. So we know that across the subregion, there is great demand for the National Development Fund and governments like it as well. Mm-hmm. But we also wanted to respond to people who have an interest in acquiring real estate choosing that lifestyle option, people who want to expand their business footprint into a new market for for them to test something out in a smaller market where um, they have the human capacity that will be able to do the job for them and they don't have the same kind of competition as if they tried to do it elsewhere. Mm. And we have the option, of course, that responds to people's um, consciousness So the support for the University of the West Indies, Mm -hmm. um, making that an option for people who say, I want to do a donation option, but I I want to know it goes to something specific and it's transformative. And so I think having all of those options available to you in the Antigua and Barbuda program makes it a really compelling case to to say these people are actually serious about what they're trying to do. It's not purely transactional. They're trying to change the country. They're trying to to set the path for the future. And I think that that image, that posturing, sets us apart from most Mm -hmm. of the other programs. That's a fair comment, actually. I'm just thinking in my Rolodex of 
the, the, the programs uh, in your neighboring islands, you do have the most options, actually, uh, from the uh, University of West Indies to the NDF, the business option, the real estate option, the, within the real estate option, there's a lot of diversity as well. Sorry? Yeah, we have yeah. absolutely solid options available. Yeah. And I think um, with that, the lifestyle that goes that with goes those with options, because mm -hmm. they were well thought through, yes. so that uh, you know, if somebody wanted to come and do a business, open a, a restaurant, do a yeah. development, you yeah. know, you have those options within the business option to do so, mm -hmm. um, as well as, you know, buy real estate and as on the real estate option. Oh, University of West Indies is huge. Indeed. I mean, it's really Indeed. one of um, the feathers that we have in our cap is that, that um, option for bigger families. Yes. Because you have to be a you know, family of six to do yeah. the, the um, University of West Indies option. I think, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, have, we have clients, the clients actually want to see that they're making a difference. Now, I do have uh, also clients who look at uh, this process and they say, my colleagues, this is very intrusive and comprehensive. Oh, my God, you really need to know all that. So, so Sherilyn, back to you as the deputy CEO. What would you respond to uh, these applicants who, who um, obviously have to submit quite a bit of information? And, and you know, to, to, to set proper expectations, it, it is a comprehensive process as it should be, but w w what's your take on this? Because I know you spend a lot of, of your day we, reviewing. <laughs> we do. We, we learn a lot about the, the people who are applying for citizenship through the process, mm -hmm. through the information we ask for. And we're sensitive to how people may see some of these queries, but that has to be balanced with what this process is about. This is about the grant of citizenship. This is the most valuable thing that we have um, as as um, individuals in any country. Mm -hmm. It's our highest call, it's our, our greatest honor. Mm -hmm. And so when we are sharing that with, with anyone else, um, regardless of the mode that is being used to do that, we want to make sure that this grant is to the people who are most deserving. That's what we say all the time in the program. Mm -hmm. And so we want to really know you because you are becoming our brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. So the questions we ask are, yes for information and they are to ensure that we are not bringing into the family of our nation individuals who are eventually going to cause us some grief and pain um, <laughs> but we really want to know who you are what your interests are um, because what we're hoping will happen is that for most of our clients this is not going to be purely transactional for mobility or whatever their imperatives are at the moment we want you to develop a relationship with the country uh, however long that takes we do want you to come and visit yes, yes but we want you to keep coming mm -hmm. back and we want you to find things to support and to volunteer to mm -hmm. and so if you have special interests and special skills um, we want to know what those things are what mm -hmm. your historical background is because you may find a niche there where you come on one of your visits and you say I want to spend some time supporting this initiative because mm -hmm. This is a country that I'm connected to. And, and in fact, we, we, we're experiencing, again, I, a set of clients, no less from Canada, who are exactly looking at that from, from their experience, from their background, from their expertise, how they could bring that to, uh, to Antigua and Barbuda. So a point well taken. Sorry. And I think that, yeah. you know, um, going back to the application process itself, I mean, that's what people like, like licensation do. Yeah. We actually hold our clients' hands along the way, yes. explaining things to them, because it, the application process is, can be a very intrusive process, mm -hmm. where persons are divulging information that they would not necessarily divulge. Yes. So sometimes, at times, they're very hesitant to provide the, invita the imp yes. information that's required. Um, so our job is to ensure that we give them the comfort to understand that it is very confidential information, mm -hmm. number one. Mm -hmm. It will not be shared with anyone else but the government, the government and yeah. CIU. And, um, you know, we're here yeah. to hold your hand throughout, mm -hmm. ask us any questions. Mm -hmm. You know, we're happy to show you. If it is that you don't know how to do a job letter properly or a professional letter, we provide you with 
with um, you know that support around that. But also, let's face it, you know, not everyone's life is white as snow or easy to understand. There are sometimes gray zones in people's lives, and the expertise that you bring with the the understanding of where you know what is where is that line that yeah. Sherilyn and her team would say. That's a no-go, and there's an obvious, obviously, anyone with criminal backgrounds need not apply. They will not get past go. We know that, right? But sometimes there are things that are surmountable, and other times they're not. And so it does re require a bit of reflection, doesn't it? Yeah, and yeah. honesty. Yes. And honesty, because I think we, yes. if a client is, is asking us certain questions, or they want to hide something or whatnot, you know, I said, you, know, you need to tell the truth, because mm. they will uncover it. I mean, yes. we had a client. Um, who was um, yeah, from the Middle East, yeah. and he had gone down to, um, to Brazil and was involved with something in Brazil. And he filled out his form and whatnot, and you know, he Explained. didn't think anything of it. Okay. No, he never did, because he never thought anything okay. of it. He genuinely did not think anything of it. Next thing that we know, we get this query from, from the, the CIU asking about something in Brazil, and we're like, what? That came out of left field. That came out left field, and he was like, my goodness, I didn't know that I should have put that on yeah. on the application. Yeah. But there's a simple explanation, and, then and there we are. So yes. we, you know, an affidavit, and documenting it, and explaining, Ex yes. explaining the whole thing. Yeah, you're right. I, I could think of a few instances as well where uh, the client could genuinely not realize that that would have been pertinent yeah. uh, information. But Charlotte, you, you really do d deep dives, right? We as do. We do. I, we are required to, and just to you know reinforce something that Gay said: the confidence nature of how we treat that information mm -hmm. so you, you don't have random um, even ministers of government reaching into the CIU to get information that does not happen mm -hmm. we, we treat your information with the confidentiality that you give it to us with and unless there is some sort of legal judgment that requires us to share that that information does not leave our office. We really do understand that people are entrusting us with, with, with details of their lives that they would not normally share with someone with whom they have no deep personal relationship with. And so we honor that in, as a part of the process, and our agents do the same thing in treating that information confidentially. We, we have this uh, section within uh, these podcasts where we, we let our hair hang down and we call it the anecdota time and we, we share an anecdote of either the industry or ourselves or, or our business. Uh, and you've already shared one, and that's one I'm going to tick your box, uh, uh, Gay, because that was a good one. But you've seen a lot of applications. You've seen a lot of interesting stories. Without naming names, is there anything that strikes uh, as, as a unique or funny situation that you think our listeners would, would appreciate the story without naming names? Because I know, has there ever been a, a, a or, or in any uh, aspect of, of life in Antigua, it doesn't have to be relevant to, the, to your role as well, but we're looking for a funny, intriguing uh, anecdote that, that comes to mind. Well, um, <laughs> so many. Yeah, so many. Which, which but one it is I a family <laughs> show, right? So <laughs> which one should I filter yeah. through? Yeah. Um, well, I don't know if it, it will necessarily be funny, but I think it's important because it talks about, again, what the intent of the program was. And... Uh, Ms. Hashmi would remember, Gay would remember, that when the program was initially designed, there was actually a charitable option. There was an actual option that was a charitable option, option because, um, like we've been saying, this program has always intended, was intended to change or, and improve all aspects of society. And so there would have been an opportunity for, for NGOs and um, uh, community organizations to benefit from it. However, we realized that the framework for monitoring these these institutions was not particularly strong. Okay. And so people like Gay started saying, well, how do we make sure that these people are a real organization and they're not just coming to get money and yes. that sort of thing? So we had to relook that. Um, 
had to temper this exuberance mm -hmm. about um, doing doing all the good that we could for all the people to ensuring that the funds that come into the coffers of the government and through the doors of the CIU were best used. Yes. And how we what what we do though is we try to support a lot of organizations that we know are doing good work. Mm -hmm. So you would know in the legislation mm -hmm. that there is a proviso for the government to um, designate an institution or give funds to an institution that is doing good work. And the, C, the, the unit itself does that. We don't do a lot of promoting of those things, but we do a lot of support of social issues um, <clears throat> so that we're able to sort of bring that idea, that feeling, that desire back into the program and, and allow it to work. And Gay would have shared with you earlier that um, celebrating our 10th year this October, um, we had an event. And at that event, we had a silent auction, mm. raising funds for breast cancer awareness, it, our anniversary being in Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And so the developers partnered with us, and um, we had our guests bid on um, these prizes. And so we're going to make a significant contribution to what's a really small organization, but they do exceptional work. What happened, and we didn't know it was going to happen, is that in our National Honors Celebration, the very organization we're going to be gifting these funds to got a national honor as an institutional right. agency. So we're really excited about yeah. the, the nexus between those things, and we want to make sure that we continue to support agencies and organizations in the country that don't fit squarely in the program. Mm -hmm. They're not a real estate, they're not really a business, but they do the work that makes the, the, the quality of life mm -hmm. better for no, know, people from, in Antigua and Barbuda. I know both of you, this is actually an important feature of your own personal uh, attributes and personalities. Well, listen, ladies, both of you, thank you so very much. You were fantastic guests. <laughs> Sorry for, for the last minute uh, shuffling of things, but we're really pleased that you came and uh, spoke with us today about Antigua and Barbuda Citizenship by Investment. Uh, listeners, again, once again, please uh, stay tuned for our next episode of the Global Passport Investor, where we continue to walk you through the world of investment migration. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I should have left you anyway. What? <laughs> 33. Oh. 13. We're pros.